So welcome, everyone. I'm uh, very excited that we have Steve Siskel here today. His new book, uh, Whole Body Intelligence, Get Out of Your Head and Into Your Body to Achieve Greater Wisdom, Confidence, and Success. I actually wanted to read one of the um, uh, reviews of the book. Uh, it's actually from our very own Rachel O'Meara, who set this talk up as one of our GPAWS volunteers. Um, what Rachel says is, this is the intelligence everyone needs. Whole body intelligence will help you navigate life more easily. It helps me understand unconscious messages my body cues tell me and transforms negative beliefs I carry into positive ones, all by using the intelligence of my own body. Rachel O'Meara, sales manager at Google. I'm really looking forward to this talk, and I'd like to turn this over to Steve Sisko. Thank you. I've been to Google three, it's my third time here. I love the energy and coming to the campuses and just, um, of course, I'm using it every day. Obviously, I get my Google Alerts, and I'm Googling, and I the Google Maps to get down here. So it's pretty exciting to be here. Um, today is going to be fun. It's going to be interactive. For those of you out there, it'll be interactive as well. And um, we're not going to just listen, but we're going to do some assessment. We're going to take uh, notice of different things we feel in our body, how that relates to beliefs, how that relates to our energy how that relates to our stress, and just to become aware of what we're feeling. And, you know, for me, people always say to me, you know, how did you get into writing a book about whole body intelligence? And I'm not a doctor, and I was not a psychologist, even though I did go to school and after um, my business career and got into body-centered psychotherapy. But basically, I was in sales and business. I uh, had a purpose. I felt good. I was working with people that I believed in and uh, really helped people. But I noticed a few things. <laughs> it sounds strange, but I would write and, and put together these campaigns for people. And then I noticed that they would say one thing and their body would say something else. You know, they'd be talking about how their program relaxes people, but they'd be shaking their leg. Or um, how they're really into um, opening their heart and they'd be clinging in front of themselves. So I went, wow, something's, something's off here. And I really became interested in learning how how our body's intelligence and our connection to our body would actually work as towards success, optimization of our you know, productivity, our energy, finding our purpose. And one of my niches, which we'll work on today, is finding beliefs that live in the body. Because the body's been there since day one, right? Everything we ever felt did, there's been enough science, Candace Pert and other scientists who have shown that memories actually live in the body. Things happened, most of us, when things happened that were uncomfortable, we did uh, two things usually. We held our breath, <gasps> just not to feel, you know, just that initial response, the sympathetic nervous system to go into that. And then secondly, we would, you know, enroll our body to hold on to things we didn't get to speak or didn't get to resolve over, didn't get to express out. So I just found pretty much working in business, working with people, I would just ask them, like, tell me, um, tell me something. Tell me how you would like to see your department go. And I would hear stuff like, well, I'd really like to have the most, <coughs> excuse me. And I go, okay, try it again. I'd really like to have the most success. <coughs> I'm having trouble with that word success. And then I just, just started asking questions like, well, Huh, I notice when you say you want to have a successful department or you want your group to be the most successful, there's a little something going on in your body. You see, even though the mind is like, yeah, I can do it and I want it and, and I believe in it, the body still has the memories. And sometimes it will kind of blindside us and get in the way of us actually having what we want. Either we're communicating something or it's just an old belief. I'll give you my own examples in a minute. But this one fellow, basically when he started choking on the word success over and over, I basically had him go into his body. You know, Einstein said you can't solve a problem with the same thinking that created it. And a lot of us try to keep thinking through it. So I just started really asking people, like, well, what do you notice here? It's, I call it the body first approach, basically a, um, a loop back to my body to inquire instead of just with the mind what could I learn from my body and things would happen like he'd say well I'd say say it out loud a few times and then listen to the response listen to the impact in your body 
And with this particular executive, he found that when he said the word success, something got triggered. And of course, like most of us, what do we do? We don't want to feel uncomfortable, so we push it down. We ignore it. We numb it. We do everything we can to get away from it. My work was to get people to actually go into it. So as he went into it, the body starts to respond and the familiar feelings come back. And as he got smaller, he had kind of what's called a somatic recall or a, a cellular memory, if you've ever heard those terms. And basically by feeling in his body and not running it from, but actually breathing and going into it, he remembered something that he had pushed aside for many years. When he was young, his, uh, during Christmas and at holidays, he would look out and see everybody got wagons and bikes and, and new toys and he didn't get anything. And every time he would say to his dad, hey, dad, like what, what happened? Why didn't I get something? His dad would say, oh, son, just don't worry about it. You know, uh, money, success, it'll make you sick. So you don't need it. Well, a little kid hears that and he takes it in maybe one or a thousand times, forgets about it, but where did it go? Where did that unexpressed feeling go? Lives in the body. And you'll see some of that today. So basically he had a belief that he carried in his body. And then you could see it in his, what I call his billboard, somehow was saying to people, if I'm too successful, I'll get sick. So we worked on expressing and getting that out, get those feelings and that energy moving. And then we work on what I call a vital belief versus the viral belief, bringing in a belief that actually was, I could be successful and I could be vibrant, I could be healthy. And of course his body rejected it at first, but eventually he embodied it and his whole presentation to the world shifted. So we're gonna do some of that today too. So just to start here on the, um, body first approach. We're going to bring our whole self into the room and into our life and how it works. And I just want to, even as you're eating or whatever you're doing right now, just take a moment with no judgment, just pure observation, and just notice where your breath is originating from. Just, just notice with no, no judgment analysis like, is it way down in your lower belly or is it coming up in the chest? We're going to learn some things just about ourselves in the moment. So take a moment and just, just notice. Obviously, if we're breathing down in our belly, we're in the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the place that relaxes. The digestive system works well. Your muscles relax. Your creativity, your brain is relaxed. You have more creativity, more energy. Unfortunately, a lot of us breathe up here, which is that sympathetic nervous system. And, you know, biologically, it's there to protect us. So what it does is it shuts down the digestive system, it tenses the muscles, the heart beats fast, so we can get up the tree. You know, I have a, a dog that's a good example. So for instance, he's in the parasympathetic most of the time. He's just hanging out. He's just eating his bone. As soon as the UPS truck pulls up, which happens a lot nowadays, the UPS truck, he hears it, and he goes right into his sympathetic. Man, he's like, there's no digestion, there's no, room for food, there's no time to breathe or relax. It's like he's got to get to the door and he's at the door and he's waiting and the UPS just rings the bell and then as soon as that brake is released from the, from the truck and the UPS pulls away, he goes right back to his bone like it never happened. We don't do that unfortunately. A lot of us have that sympathetic and we get caught in it and unfortunately we're in it too often, sometimes frozen in it and we're feeling that stress, like we need to get up that tree if a tiger's chasing us, but it's not actually working for us because it tires us out and it causes digestive problems and heart and, and blood pressure. So the second thing to notice is, is it easier for you to breathe in? Just notice, that's receiving, by the way, oxygen, energy, life force, breathing in, or is it easier to breathe out, expressing? I have found in about 95, 98% of the talks I do, people find that breathing in relates to receiving. How much can I take in? Compliments, success, abundance, love, and how much my out breath, how free am I to express? So anybody that would just like to call out, did you notice anything that you didn't know just a minute ago about your breathing? Anybody, just call it out. Breathing in from your stomach or your chest, did you notice anything? Just take a moment and tune into that. And then you could scan your whole body and just notice, is there something I wasn't aware of a moment ago? Was I crunching up? Was my fist tight? 
Was I not breathing? Um, and my shoulders up to my ears? Am I thinking about the future or the past instead of being in this moment? And just scan your body and again, just ask yourself, is there anything I just noticed that I wasn't aware of five minutes ago? Because most of the time we're not in our body, right? We're in our screens, in fact, constantly changing habits, like for instance, the smartphones. I got the smartphone the first weekend it came out, and this is what started to happen, right? Looking down like this, not realizing through the years that it was pulling my muscles up in my neck. So the new habit I'm learning is to look at my phone like this. But it's more comfortable to do this, it's more familiar, but there's a huge difference in how it affects my energy, cuts off your oxygen, makes you tight, contracted versus expanded. So just take a moment, if anybody wants to call out anything, it's interactive, um, anything you noticed that you didn't know five minutes ago about your breathing, your posture, your scanning your body, something you were maybe gripping. Does anybody want to call it out? You're welcome to, please. Well, I've always wondered why I have more difficulty breathing in for longer periods of time than breathing out. And if I relate it to what you've just said, I am a very expressive person. I'm talkative, I'm outgoing, I'm an extroverted. Um, and taking in what you just said, now I want to look at, okay, how am I blocking receiving them through my breathing? I think that's excellent because you know the truth is, when things happen, for instance, 70% of the people who have won the lottery have lost it back. And you think, how could they do that? If I had $20 million, I would never blow it, right? And yet what happens is we're fam it's familiar. It's familiar to be broke. It's familiar to be you know, having trouble with your bills. All of a sudden, there's millions of dollars, and it's like, <gasps> can't take it. And that happens sometimes with love. You know, We want to meet that perfect person, but old wiring, old beliefs, old feelings in the body will get us to not be comfortable, and we won't really be expressing who we are. So I just found that breathing in fully from the belly, it's going to relax your nervous system. It's going to get you into a place where you're really receiving oxygen, and we need oxygen. We need that life force, OK? Anybody else that wants to share, just call it out. That's where we are. We're just uh, in an open forum where you can call out and say, hey, I didn't notice I was crunching up. I was thinking about something in the, that happened this morning, and I didn't realize my body was holding it. <laughs> Hi, thanks for giving the talk today. Yeah, thank um, you for being here. I personally notice that my posture definitely affects my breathing the most, whether it's my shoulders in versus my shoulders out. And like even at when I'm standing at my desk versus sitting, I find that my breathing is much healthier, like lower rather than higher in my thank chest. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. What did you notice today just in this short little exercise? Well, even when I, excuse me, <laughs> even perfect. when I was sitting down just now, like whether I had my leg on my other, like crossed, right, I could notice my breathing kind of like cave in versus like my shoulders back. It was there really interesting. Go. Yeah. Yeah, because in every moment there's an expansion and a contraction. And if they're not balanced, then we're more in the contraction. When we're contracted, obviously it's gonna cut off the oxygen, it's gonna cut off the breathing. And if there were, we have something in our mind and we don't realize our body's like this. Now, I had a, a wonderful offer from the, for this new book from the publisher. They made me a great deal and they said, you can have it out in 2016. I said, all right, I mean, that's how it usually goes, year, year and a half. They said, however, however, if you can get it done in seven weeks, we'll put it out in the summer of 15. Well, that was incentive for me, of course, seven weeks to write a book. But here's what happened. I would lean into my computer, and the more I wrote, the more I would go into it, and I had no idea. It's like it constricts your creativity. It's constricting my breathing. My fiance would walk by, because she's into yoga, and she would yell out, slump asana. You know what asana means, it's posture. Slump asana, I go, ah, oh, thank you. And all of a sudden, like, my brain would relax. You know, as we go further, you'll notice movement opens a new neural net in your brain. Anytime you feel stuck, get up and move. It starts to open up the brain. It gets the oxygen moving. Often we're sitting too much. So what we're really focusing on today is having an expanded awareness. Instead of just IQ and EQ, we're going to use BQ. Obviously, you've heard a lot about EQ, and that's basically that I'm feeling and sensitive to your emotions, and I'm also compassionate and feeling my own emotions and able to express them. One thing I've noticed with EQ, sometimes people don't know what they feel. They go, well, 
I think I'm angry, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm sad, I'm, I'm, I'm just not sure. So that's where, again, we use the body and we start to breathe and notice and feel, and the body will allow us to really notice what we're feeling and what we're not feeling. So with this expanded awareness, as you can see, there's a lot of advantages. You know, you detect stress. You can notice, I call the body your thought monitor. If you're slumping, if you're contracting, most likely you're having a negative thought or you're thinking something about someone. It's not, it's not a happy thought, right? When we're happy, we make a touchdown, you know, we're like a big open peacock and when we're contracted, we're like a little bird that's just been through an oil spill, you know? So it's just something to catch every day, you know? It's like either we're open or we're closed. The same thing with the breathing. And that can happen because the thought is thinking about something that happened this morning or a meeting later or incomplete communication with someone. And then the thought creates a feeling into the body. And as we go further on in our talk today, you'll see how it actually affects the brain and the body. Every thought is affecting us. So I use the body as a thought monitor. If I'm slumping, there's a reason. There's something going on that's making me slump. If I'm contracting, there's a reason. So your body can really become a great detector, and you can catch when you're assuming and blaming instead of being body first. You know, body first, I'll give you a quick example. So I lived in Hawaii for about six years, and one day I was at Waimea Canyon, if you know about it in Kauai, it's a beautiful, it's like the Grand Canyon of Hawaii, it's pretty amazing. And I'm sitting on the rock, and I'm actually feeling the warmth of the rock. And as I'm looking out at the canyon, I'm noticing and breathing and noticing how expanded the view makes me feel and how beautiful the colors are. And I'm, I'm having a whole body experience. Up comes a tourist bus and a guy gets off and he comes up and he right away says, hey, have you ever heard of Little River? Uh, not sure. Yeah, Little River is where I live and it doesn't look like this. Um, yeah, we don't have this where I live. And he went, took a picture and got back on the bus. So that's somebody that didn't have a whole body experience. You see, he barely, I don't even know, even know if he looked at it. But the point is we do that a lot at work. Somebody drops something on our desk. Somebody asks us something that demands of us. And instead of feeling and noticing the impact it had on us, we go into our mind. Well, they're wrong, and I'm going to call my friend. I'm going to talk about it. We waste a lot of time. So imagine if we just took that moment when, Wow, I'm noticing my stomach got tight when she said that. I wonder what that might be. And often, as we go further in the presentation today, you'll see often that's a memory. That's something that has nothing to do with the moment, but the moment triggered the past. And as we learn more about ourselves and how we get triggered, whether we've been betrayed, so on a first date, we're already projecting that this person's going to betray us. Uh, I was a sales trainer. Part of how I got into this is watching people. Here's the truth. When I leaned forward, because I was a little needy and I wanted the sale, my customers leaned back and I was like, I didn't get any sales. When I leaned back and was aware of my breathing, my tensions, my tightening, and I relaxed, I got orders. I became the number one sales rep out of 500 salespeople, and it was an inner game the whole time. My machines were the same. I sold business equipment. They weren't much different than anybody else's, but it was my presentation. It was basically the more I relaxed I was, the more clients wanted to be with me. So just take a moment and think about that and feel into this. And in my journey, I've been very fortunate that I've worked in a medical office. So I've been working on this with medical. People have asthma, tight uh, arthritis and stuff. A lot of it is unexpressed feelings and unexpressed emotions. So you're young. I want to encourage you, breathe, move, and express every day, constantly moving. You'll see why in a few moments, but not to hold things in. I think holding things in is really where we start to build up that tension. It starts to wreak havoc on our bodies. So I've worked in medical offices. I've been in a lot of buildings down here in the Silicon Valley. I've been very fortunate to give speeches and so forth. One day I got a phone call and it was a school of physical therapists. And they said, how would you like to come to Mexico? We're taking a whole group down to this really remote place, and we want them to learn whole body intelligence. Hey, that sounds great. So I fly to Mexico, and I get off, and I'm taken to this nice hotel. We have a nice lunch. And then I'm told the boat will be here in a few moments. Said, OK, good. So the boat comes. It's a little fisher, fisherman's boat. And I and half the class get in it. And we come up to this remote island that has no electricity.
And I get there and we go to this beautiful palapa, like this nice house with this open windows and everything. And this is where we're going to have the class. But you as the teacher, you're going to have the top palapa. Oh, ooh, top palapa, okay. <laughs> top of the mountain. Meantime, it's a straight up jungle. This is not a picture, but I want to give you an idea of that palapa that I got, that, that amazing palapa. It was like this in the sense that it had no, no walls. It wasn't next to a river, it was in the middle of the jungle. But it was like this, that basically I got up there and there was a hammock and no walls and I'm at the top of the jungle and I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, what did I do? What did I sign up for? So it's almost sunset and it gets dark and I'm hearing, you know, all these animals under me. I'm like, oh my God, what? this is crazy. Oh, by the way, the guy who carried my suitcase up to the Palapa told me, turn over your shoes because there's a lot of scorpions. I'm saying, oh, great, great. So I'm turning over my shoes. I'm laying in this hammock like, oh my God, what am I, how am I going to get through the night? Ah, I just let the animals below me go to sleep. I got up in the morning. It was beautiful. Peacocks and everything. But here's what I wanted to share. I got up and there was a vibrant village. I had never seen anything like it before. There was no electricity, there were no phones, there were no smartphones, there was nothing except they woke up and I got up pretty early. I mean, as soon as that sun, I was like ready to get out of my palapa and go down. Everybody was up. Everybody was moving. Everybody was doing something. Little, older, didn't matter. Lifting, grabbing, moving, smiling, happy. And it was pretty amazing to see such a vibrant community. No one was laying down. No one looked depressed. Everybody knew exactly what they were supposed to do. So I uh, started my class, and I had people breathing and releasing and, and getting some stress out. And a couple people were making some loud sounds. So all of a sudden, a bunch of the villagers ran up. And the one who really spoke English well said, what's going on? What are you doing? I said two things. I said, well, uh, we're helping people release some stress that they carry in their body. And they were totally confused by that. And I said, and also maybe things from their past that they want to get rid of. Well, that, they had no idea what I was talking about. They said, we don't understand this concept. We get the words and we, we understand what you're saying, but we don't know this concept, stress. Imagine that. Like this is a village where people just get up and live their life and then at night they sing and there's a whole community together. We don't understand this concept of stress. Secondly, we don't know what you mean by having something in the past because they engage in every moment. When they're picking something, they're engaged with it. When they're playing with the kids, they're engaged in it. Unfortunately, a lot of us, unlike the dog, we something happens, we freeze, it goes into our body, and as you see, you'll see later, the neuro net starts to stay in that thought. And then next thing you know, that stress, even though something happened a day ago or a week ago or a month ago or a year ago, is still in our body. Does that make sense? Yeah, we carry too much. So we've got to find ways to intervene, catch those thoughts, and move forward. So here's what I took away from the village. And this is something that each of us can really learn from. Number one, they were all part of a community. No one was isolated. No one was alone. They knew what their purpose was. They woke up and they just lived. Secondly, they understood clearly what their culture was. They aligned with their culture. Third, they thrived. Whatever their role was, it was fine. I went around that village for two weeks. No one was unhappy. No, there was no competition, jealousy. It was just like, I'm doing what I'm doing and I'm okay with it. Never felt isolated. They were engaged in the moment, no matter what they were doing. And I watched, and they were breathing and moving and expressing so that their energy levels were higher. They weren't exhausted. They weren't depressed. They didn't need to run to coffee at 2 o'clock. They were energized and moving. So they breathed, moved, and expressed themselves, and they ate a healthy, energizing diet. So just something to learn. I came back, and I was totally committed. to. St I started a business exchange. I got involved in my community. I changed my diet. I made sure that I was really clear about my purpose, and I was aware of when I wasn't engaging in the moment, when I was stuck in my head, versus feeling and noticing in my body. Years later, years later after that, I heard about this Blue Zones. I don't know if you've heard about it, but there's even a book out about it now. And there were some population experts, some doctors, some physicists that went around the world and looked for where people had higher longevity. And they found very much of what I saw, that there was big social engagement, there was family, they put less smoking, they had a, a clean diet. 
But here's the key, constant, moderate physical activity, constant. So when my son was growing up, because I taught him how to breathe and move, he would get up all the time in his chair and the teachers would call me and go, hey, what's going on? He's not supposed to stand up. I went, they're sitting too long. So I highly recommend that you get up from your chairs as much as you can and just walk around. What it'll do is it'll get you to breathe, it'll get you to move, but more than anything, there have been studies done that show when we move, the neural nets of our brain start to open up and then we can get creative thoughts. So when I work with a group, we're walking, we're moving, anytime there's a stuck moment, all right, everybody up, let's breathe and move, and all of a sudden the energy in the room changes, the thoughts change, and we're out of that locked in brain neural net. So movement is a key to all of this. Here's Unfortunately, what a lot of us are doing, and there's so much study on this, I'm sure you've seen it, you know, 60, the American Psychiatry uh, Association, Psychological Association, thousands and thousands of workers, you know, 67% of people aren't engaged, they're stressed, 80% of people are stressed at their uh, office visits. So the point is, we obviously have some stress from change, a lot of us aren't used to change, when we were younger something changed. We, so resilience really is the ability to breathe through, to me, and move through and tell the truth when something changes. So just remember that, when something changes, rather than getting into your mind and getting frozen, get up and breathe and move and get that energy moving. Obviously, lack of control at times, am I getting enough support, stress in relationships, because we're not speaking authentically. We're often just projecting, well, when you did that, when you did that, versus the communication I teach in offices is, when you did that, or when you said that to me, I noticed a little stress in my chest. It's, it's something that I felt, or something that happened to me. Sometimes, sometimes you can talk with people like that, sometimes you can't. But the idea is, is for you to be aware, what I call the body first, the loop of awareness, for you to be aware in your body, how did that impact me? When I saw that, how did that impact me? When my boss gave me this, or my project leader gave me this task, what happened for me? So that you can have a whole body experience and really be engaged, what's happening for me in this moment? So that's the, the versus the blue or the stress. And of course, as we know, we used to be very intrasomatic, right? This is how we were. We felt, we smelled, we sensed. If you watch babies, they breathe, their belly goes up and down, they smell, they're very into their environment until things happen, and then we go uh, extrasomatic. Basically, extrasomatic means that we're trying to get all of our information from outside. So what I'm suggesting is, start to go into the body, because the body was there from day one. It will give you information. If your stomach's yelling when you're wanting to say no, listen to it. Most of us override it. I was a people pleaser. I would override it, and then I would be so upset. Why did I say yes to that? Ah, oh, I don't want to do this tonight. I've made it a habit to go, wait a second. You know, I'm, I'm getting a no. Or let me call you back. So trust your gut. There's a reason. Deepak Chopra talks about the mobile brain in a book by Candace Pert. She's an amazing book around your molecules and your emotions. And basically, what he was saying is that there's a mobile brain, meaning there's brains and intelligence in our whole body, except we're on smartphones so much and we're on virtual that we forget. So most of us are living up here. Secondly, uh, Paul Pearsall wrote a book, The Heart's Code. And what he discovered as a surgeon, a heart transplant, that the recipients who actually got the new heart took on characteristics, sometimes even food, the foods that they desired were from the person who died. What does that tell you about the heart? Anybody? Muscle memory. Memory. But imagine that the heart, not in the body of John, but in the body of Bill, Bill starts to take on some memories, some feelings, some new thoughts. There's also a guy named uh, Gary, Larry Gershon, and Dr. Gershon talks about the gut. Says the gut has total neurons. The gut is like neuropeptides. The gut, gut is like the brain up here. That's why we call it gut instinct. So just really take a moment and take in, huh? How, how often am I going outside when maybe I could go inside? So here's what I get phone calls for a lot when I come down to Silicon Valley or I go into companies. Hey, we need life-work balance. I think that's a great concept. I think it's a great concept. It's great to take a vacation, but here's what happens. 
even when people go on vacation, they're still thinking, they're still using their smartphones, they're, it takes three days to kind of wind down. I lived in Hawaii, people come for a week, I went, uh-oh, because it took them three, four days just to kind of feel their body again, and then they'd be planning on when they had to leave and what they had to get back to. So work-life balance is great, but I like to go more into mind-body balance, meaning how often I'm using my mind how often am I unplugging and getting into my body? Exercise, yoga, uh, dance, movement, taking a walk, swimming. Here's the difference for me, and this is so true. When I wake up in the morning and I do my breathing exercise, a little bit of stretching, and then I go to the swimming pool, I get all these ideas, I get downloads in the water, like my whole day is, oh, I've set a tone for the day. But when I don't do that, and I go right to the machines, I write to the phones, right to work, it's a different day because I'm already in my mind and my body's been left behind. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we really need to activate and stay in the body more than anything. So what I'd like to do is have everybody take a few moments and for those of you that are watching live or watching this later, you'll get it on the screen. We're going to ask you to just take a moment with no judgment just to get an assessment, just to have an assessment of Basically, where am I in my body-mind connection? We're going to do this together, one question at a time. If you want to use a pen and give yourself a score, you can. At the end, uh, you can also go to a web link and actually get a response to your specific score, as well as tips and videos and audios that will support you, no charge, just to boost your score. You'll have a 1 to 10. And for those of you watching from out, you'll be able to go from 1 to 10, 1 meaning not often, 10 meaning all the time. So let's go through this together. The first question, I consciously take pauses from what I am doing to take a few deep, full, relaxing breaths. By the way, there was a study, the Framingham study, 73% of our toxins are removed from the respiratory system. I never knew that. I thought it was sweating, going to the bathroom. You probably did too. That alone should make you breathe more consciously. 73%, so we really need to clear toxins through the lungs. Okay, next question. I am generally aware of my breathing dynamic. For instance, I catch myself when I'm holding my breath or notice when I'm breathing labored or high up in my chest. Just one if you never do that, and ten if you always are somewhere in the middle. Third question is, I scan my body to connect with how I'm really feeling in the moment. For instance, I check to see if my belly's relaxed, or my shoulders are crunched, or to see if I'm tightly gripping the phone. Boy, I tell you what, if you do spot checks and scan your body, and keep that integrative conversation going between your brain and your body, it's helped people. I've gotten people that had headaches and neck aches because they were crunched all day and they didn't know it. Driving to work, didn't know that they were gripping the wheel. Just that asking myself, I have a lot of clients, I go, just ask yourself several times a day, what am I noticing in my body as I scan my body? When I feel an uncomfortable sensation, pain, or emotion in my body, my tendency is to tune into it and listen to what it might be telling me versus ignoring my body or numbing myself. A lot of us ignore our bodies. We were told not to feel. We were punished if we felt. Uh, I even have a story of uh, recently when I was in the hot springs, a little girl was having the best time in the pool. Her mom came screaming up, I've got some lemonade for you, honey. And she looked up like, oh, I'm having fun in the water, but okay. It wasn't lemonade. It was cucumber water from the spa. Now, I'm sorry. Cucumber water is not lemonade, right? Lemonade's lemon sugar, honey. So this little girl, I watched it. This is what happens to so many of us. She drinks it, she doesn't like it, and she hands it back, but mom's disappointed. Mom wants her to like it. So mom says, it's good, try it again. Well, after about three pleads from mom, she finally goes, yeah, it's good. And then mom walked away and the little girl contracted. Just think about that for a second. Mommy, I'm hot in here. It's not hot in here. Oh, what happens to the little kid when they're told they don't know what they feel? Trust their body, can't trust their you can't trust your body, you can't trust your So some of us heard that. 
even if it was benevolent, like, oh, this bathtub's too hot, oh, get in, it's fine. I'm scared, oh, you're not scared. Those kind of things happen to many of us. So many of us learn to escape, to not feel it. We don't want to feel it because it's uncomfortable. Or if we feel it and tell somebody what we felt, they might not believe us. So next question is, I'm conscious of negative, negative things I say about my body. For instance, my boss gives me a headache. One client I work with had a neck ache, back neck ache for six years. Take this in. I said to him, what started six years ago? He said, oh, let me think. Let me, oh, yeah, I stopped paying, I stopped paying the IRS. I said, okay. Let's see if there's a link. What did you do when you started p not paying the IRS? He said, well, I got scared, and I would always have this saying, oh, forget about it, put it in the back of my head. Hmm. Six years, this guy had off and on a headache. I told him, call the IRS. They're not going to arrest you. They're going to ask for a monthly payment. He called the IRS, made a monthly payment, headache went away. What I'm trying to say is there's enough science, if you look, that says if you say, you know, I hate my body, my boss makes me sick, that's a pain in my neck, your body's intelligent. You're sending a thought. You'll see a film soon that'll show you exactly what happens. If you're sending that thought every day, I'm not good enough, I'm not going to get the job, I'm whatever that is, it starts to wire it in and gets fixed as an identity. It gets fixed in the brain so that even though you want to have another thought, the brain is used to and becomes addicted to that emotional response. That makes sense? The more we say it, our body believes it, and then we start to believe that that's who we are. And we're not. We're not necessarily any of those things that people told us we were. All right, just keep going through the test. I'm aware of how congruent my words and body language are. So when somebody says, how are you doing? You go, I'm fine. They're going to notice it. You're gripping your jaw. You're gripping your... How often do you say something and your body language is shaking when you say, no, I'm, I'm good with it, and then you're nervous? Everybody picks up on that, whether we know it or not. More than ever, people are very keen. They're observant. So if it's affecting how you sell, how you communicate, how you are in your relationships, just ask yourself, am I, are my words and my body congruent? Are they aligned? The next question for you is, when I make decisions, whether they're small or large, do I listen to my body? Take that in for a moment. Do you make decisions because somebody told you? Do you make decisions because you want to please somebody? Do you make decisions just off the top of your head? Or do you take a moment and go, boy, when I was asked to do that, why is my stomach tightening up? Maybe there's something to learn there. Maybe your stomach has a memory. Maybe your stomach, your body reaction is smarter than your mind for the moment. Maybe your body has something that's very important. So I've trained myself to take a moment and listen. The loop of awareness back to the body to go, why is my body having that response to that belief or that um, abundance or that love or that gift? Why is my body responding that way? I'm aware of my posture. This is really important. When we get up and down, when we sit at our desk, when we get out of a car, when we get in a car, these are transitions that the more aware you become, that's whole body intelligence. I'm aware of how I get up, how I sit down, how I slouch, how I come home, how I walk through the door. Becoming more aware. It doesn't mean you're a robot and you're thinking about it all the time. It just becomes a new awareness. Your brain starts to activate, oh yeah, when she said that, I noticed I bent down. Maybe I stand up. I work with presentations, speakers, people are on stage, and they have no idea that they're up there shaking their hand or they're talking about one thing and their body's giving you another message. It's just unconscious. Once they become aware of it, what happens is they can make that physical change, become more congruent, they'll get a better result. People will believe you more. That's the key, because you'll be more authentic. I'm aware of any past trauma, events, memories that I hold in my body and how they influence my behavior. Real quickie. I'm pretty confident. Hopefully, I look relaxed. I love doing this. This is what I do, and I love doing it. However, the first time I left my neighborhood, we, I grew up in a row house neighborhood in Baltimore City. You've seen films like Barry Levinson and other films. That was my neighborhood. And everything was safe. Everybody was aunt and uncle. There were no locks, never heard of crime, never knew of anything other than, hey, this is a good life. 23 cousins, we just played ball in the street. The first time, about three of my cousins and I decided to leave the neighborhood. The first time, we went up to the main thoroughfare. I stuck out my thumb. I was all excited to go. And what happened was a, a car pulled up with some rough guys that I had never seen in my life. 
these kind of guys. They got up, they called us names, they beat us up, we ran home. What's the belief, not here, because I'm always excited, but what's the belief that sometimes my body might show me before I get on a stage, before I get on a big TV show, before I get on something? Does anybody want to guess what the belief that lives in my body is? Fear. Fear of? Yes, new things. New things. It's big out there. Hey, you're excited. There's going to be a million people watching this. My mind's going, woohoo! And all of a sudden, my body goes, oh my God, what's going on? I've been in the green room where I start to feel that, and I realize, oh, rather than trying to push that aside and go do my interview, what is that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, that reminds me of, yeah, okay, so that happened then. My body has a memory of it. Things that happen will trigger us, and then we start to make assumptions. She's going to dump me. My boss doesn't like my job. I didn't do a good job. But most of those are not true. They're just old body memories. And fortunately, I breathe, I shake it out, and I say the opposite. I'm going to be safe, people are going to love it, I'm going to have a good time, and my body relaxes and I go have a good interview. So it's a really important to, thing to remember is like, how aware am I of how past events affect me today? Do I share what I feel with people or do I stuff it and hold it in and let my body hold it? That causes a lot of today's modern illnesses and diseases, stuff that's being held in. Once you express it, it makes a big change. I set aside 30 minutes a day, at least 30 minutes to walk, move, breathe, yoga, something physical. I have physical techniques and practices that I use to cope with, and we're going to practice one today called the rebooting technique. And then 13, I have a stress management program or ritual that I follow daily, such as meditation, prayer, somatic techniques. So, let me ask you a question. Anybody that wants to call it out, what did you learn? Did you learn anything about yourself with no judgment from taking that assessment test? Well, it was kind of, um, I think I'm pretty good on some of these things, but, I, but like, like the one about the, uh, when I feel a couple sensation, you know, do I tune into it or ignore it? But the thing is, I put a little asterisk on it because I don't always, I'm not always aware of them. <laughs> yeah. So, um, That's it. We're not aware of it because we're not in our body. We're often in our heads most of the time. Secondly, just the idea of when I feel it, I have a choice. Every moment's a choice point. Am I going to numb it? Am I going to ignore it? What I'm encouraging you to do is feel a little bit. It's kind of like when you put something in the laundry and you leave it in there, it gets funky. When you take it all the way through the dryer, ah, that's how I feel. I taught my son that. I teach everybody. When you have a feeling, get it out. Move it through. Don't have it build up in your body. Okay? So what I want to do, the rebooting technique, then I'm going to show you a little film on the brain and then we'll take questions. So this is a technique that everybody can practice. Um, I'm working with, I worked with 80 attorneys over at eBay who are doing this twice a day. Communications increased. Um, everybody's feeling rebooted. Bottom line is you're plugged in so many hours a day. I have an executive, a sports executive, really big organization. He tells me I have traumatic, the worst part of my day is 10 minutes. Does anybody want to guess what those 10 minutes are? Just throw it out. What do you think? Can you put your phone away? That's close. Put my computer away. The hardest part of his day is the shower in the morning. Isn't that crazy? For 10 or 15 minutes, he has mega anxiety because separation anxiety from the phone. Who might be calling? What did I miss? Did a trade happen? I know that sounds extreme, but this is what I'm seeing all the time. The adrenaline of that phone, sending a text and until it comes back with a response. And then the brain, even though we multitask a lot, there's been so many studies, I've got many in my book, that show that multitasking actually, we're using one part of the brain when we're speaking, another part of the brain while we're typing, back and forth until our brain gets exhausted and we press send and we're, oh, I didn't want to send that because we're not focused. So our brain just gets a lot of work that we don't want to have to deal with. So let's go through the rebooting. Step one is to unplug. And like I said, in some cases like that gentleman, it's really hard to unplug. But I'm recommending twice a day, just like a meditation practice, you go into the chill room or you sit at your desk and you unplug, meaning everything turns off. Second, let's practice. You take three deep breaths from way down here 
through your nose and just ah. Relaxing the jaw, a yawn is a stress release. So feel how that feels, you do three of those. It's a simple technique. Then you observe, like we've been doing here today. Just scan your body and notice. Oh, I didn't notice my shoulder was up to my ear. Ah, I didn't realize I was leaning forward. I was crunching my legs. Four, you report to yourself. The brain body is now speaking to each other. Oh, I'm noticing my stomach's tight. When she said that to me, I noticed I got gripping my hand. Step five, make an adjustment. Shake it out, move it up, get up, shake out your body. Just notice you can move through that. And then seven is reboot, meaning take the time to actually notice and make a conscious decision. So before I walked in here, before I met Van, I sat in my car and I did the rebooting technique so I could be aligned. Let the stress out, any stress I was holding from driving down or anticipation of this talk. And then I let it go and then I'm congruent. I'm in my body and I'm in my mind. This was a test done just to give you some validity at a medical center. Lots of patients went through it on an average 55% stress reduction from doing these seven steps. Heart went from erratic to smooth. That's what we want to do. We want to have a smooth, relaxed day each day. So these viral and vital beliefs I told you about, now I want to show you how they affect our income. So this is the brain. And what you're seeing there basically, that's your brain. That's so the movie gave me permission to use these clips. So see those little sparks? That's those thoughts. If right now you're having a thought like, oh God, I gotta go, or I'm feeling this, or what happened this morning? I'm no good, whatever it is, that's shooting a synapsis, that's shooting a thought into your brain. It's not just something that's up here, it's in here. Now here's what happens. The brain is made up of tiny nerve cells called neurons. These neurons have tiny branches that reach out and connect to other neurons to form a neural net. Each place where they connect is integrated into a thought or a memory. Now the brain builds up all its concepts by the law of associative memory. For example, ideas, thoughts, and feelings are all constructed and interconnected in this neural net and all have a possible relationship with one another. Now here's the key. Watch we what know happens here. Logically, that nerve cells that fire together wire together. This is what happens in your brain if you keep saying something over and over. A long-term relationship. If you get angry on a daily basis, if you get frustrated on a daily basis, if you suffer on a daily basis, if you give reasons for the victimization in your life, you're rewiring and reintegrating that neural net on a daily basis. See so what happens? Neural net now has a long-term. You don't even know it, but you're thinking that thought called an identity. We also know that nerve cells that don't fire together no longer wire together. They this is an intervention. This is like rebooting. Because Taking a break from those thoughts. Thought Get up and move. That produces a chemical response in the body. Every time we interrupt it, those nerve cells that are connected to each other start breaking the long-term relationship. Okay, so just for a moment, to yourself, think about one thing that you would like to create in your life right now. Whether it's work, whether it's a project, whether it's bringing your art, whether it's falling in love. Take a moment and just think about something that you want in your life. Good. What's happening in your body as you think about it? Sometimes people get tight. Sometimes people get expanded. Just be aware. Because what happens is, when we have those thoughts of our vision, of our goals, of our dreams, the body is responding. Like the fellow who couldn't embody success. I worked with a person who wrote hits, hit records, and all of a sudden he couldn't write. And what happened was, there were memories that were coming up because it had been a year since he toured, and at the last tour he lost some people in his life, had some negative things happen, so in his body was the memory of touring's not gonna be good for me and it blocked the brain. So this is a lot of my work has been helping people. What could be blocking you from just going all the way? Like if I thought, well, I can't sell a book because everybody's selling books and I'll never get a publisher and I don't have anything important to say. If I said that over and over and over, that would lock into a neural net in my brain and I would never be able to write a book. So I intervene, shake that out, say the opposite, move the energy, and all of a sudden my brain's free and I'm starting to open up a space to actually be aware and awake that I actually could sell a book. I actually could 
do well. I could actually go up four levels in my job. I could actually create somebody in my life that's going to love me. See, so the brain is so important, but it comes through the body. So what I want to ask before we go into questions is, ask yourself for a moment, what did I learn about myself today? Just take a mental note, something you learned about yourself from this talk. And secondly, what will you do to, um, okay, what will you do to get um, more resilient, boosting your energy? Just take a moment and ask yourself that. What did I take away from today? And what can I do that would make my life different? Maybe it's breathing more consciously. Maybe I learned today that I want to scan my body more and not crunch up when I could be open. Maybe I learned to communicate instead of hold something in and catch those thoughts. So there's any questions? Anybody here have a question that you would like to ask? Um, so where do you find the balance of maybe over-communicating? And how, how would you express that? Thank you. Well, you know, I don't go at the grocery store and tell people, hey, I noticed today. Uh, but I find it's really important for me to, number one, communicate with myself several times a day. Oh, I'm gripping the wheel. Glad I said I noticed that. Also, in my business communications, my fiance, my son, my close, I'm willing to say, hey, when you said that, it didn't feel good. I'm not making it about you, but I'm inquiring. What I really look for is coworkers and, and collaborators where we can go in there together. Hey, when you said that, it brought up something for me and it's in my body. Let me see what it is. Tremendous new insights, tremendous intimacy, tremendous communication comes out of that. Okay? Thank you. Does that help? So the balance is, if you're feeling it strong enough, you either have to say it to yourself and go outside and shake it out, or you need to communicate directly to the person. Because what will happen is, <gasps> it will implode inside of us, and that's what causes a lot of the dis-ease in our bodies. It's just overwhelmed. Pamela Peake, a tremendous uh, person in stress, she's at the University of Maryland, says, our bodies just can't hold that many thoughts and that much stress in a day. So that's why I swim and breathe and move and kind of balance it. But I like to communicate what I feel because that's more what I'm engaging in the moment versus what I'm projecting, assumptions, blame, and so forth. It's changed my life. Just less stress on me, better relationships. Thanks again for giving this talk. It's been really great. Um, I had a question regarding number four on the survey. Yeah, please. So you talked a little bit about how when you have an uncomfortable sensation, um, it's better to kind of internalize it and, and realize what's going on rather than just push it away. Um, because even though you try, I guess the goal is kind of the same. When you push it away, you're trying to overcome it with your mind, but your body still remembers it. So I was just wondering like, if you have any advice on how do you go about helping your, your body overcome it as well and not just your mind? Thank you. That's a great question, by the way. So here's the thing. When something comes up that's uncomfortable, like me being in the green room, hearing my name, and then all of a sudden I get tense, if I tried to push it away, what would happen is I would strain my body, I would be faking it, and I would go out and do an interview that was kind of like still holding on to it. So what I always do is I breathe and I feel where it is in my body and I go right to that spot. And I touch it and I breathe into it and I, maybe I shake. And if I get in touch with something, I start to say the opposite. You know, I am safe. I will be fine. I am going to be received, whatever it is. But I think in any case, if you're feeling uncomfortable about something, get some help. Do some breathing. Do some moving. Go outside and move it. Because what will happen is the more we swallow it, like we saw in the film, it just says, I can't feel or I've got to hold on to this. Quick story, somebody had asthma in one of these talks. I'm not a doctor, but I just said, when you breathe, what happens? <gasps> it gets stuck, and she was afraid to feel it. It was uncomfortable. Nobody wants to feel uncomfortable. But what happened is, by feeling it, she got in touch with when her grandfather died, and she was young, she was told, don't cry. Don't be upset. Don't be angry at the funeral. And she <gasps> kept holding it in, and she got into a habit of rather than saying what I feel, I was trained to hold it in, asthma. She expressed out what she felt in a few sessions, and the asthma went away. In other words, get, in, get it off your chest. That's, that's literally it. Get it off your chest. Thanks again, Steve. Thank, Thank you so much, man. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Thanks out there, too. Have an amazing day.